Namaste. So it's raining this morning, so I'm inside. <laughs> Maybe you can hear it in the background. Beautiful rainy morning. So let's continue with verse 10. When the mind moves even a little, that is samsara, worldly bondage. When the mind abides firmly and motionlessly in the state of self, that is mukti, liberation. This is certain. Therefore know that the wise man must hold his mind firm by supreme self-awareness, not by effort. Several people ask this question. Will yoga bring me to the ultimate realization? Or can tantra or something similar, devotion or something like that? Well, like we said last time, Buddha said there are 84,000 doors. Uh, there's probably more than that. There's probably a different door for each person. Because we're all unique. No two of us are identical, even identical twins. So that means our path, our method, and our ultimate uh, way of attaining enlightenment may be different. But the enlightenment itself is always the same. And what is it? Emptiness. And when we get down here to a little further, two or three more verses, I'm going to do a whole uh, video just on emptiness and define what it is very precisely. But take it for now that the goal, the actual realization, is emptiness. That doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness is shining with sat chit ananda being, huh? unconditional being, unlimited consciousness, and incomparable bliss. To know this emptiness, this void, as, as it's called in this translation, this is enlightenment. Huh? This is self-realization, self with a capital S. So, all right. When the mind moves even a little, that's samsara. Well, mind is going to move. That's what mind does. <laughs> mind is always changing, always moving, always jumping here and there like a monkey. <laughs> as long as there is I, there's going to be mind. Because I is a product of the mind. I have many times made reference to the Buddha's Mula Pariyaya Sutta. You should look it up and read it. It describes how the mind projects the thought of mine onto the objects it perceives. And because there's so many things now are marked with mine, you know, like those guys who go around with spray cans, painting, t tagging everything. Well, we do that. Uh, we all do that. <laughs> Everything we see, hear, taste, smell, touch, or think about, we label as mine. These are my thoughts, my sensations, my perceptions, and so on. So if all these things are mine, there must be an I, right? <laughs> so you find it and show it to me. Where is it? Huh? Bring it up. <laughs> Where is it? You can't find it. There is no such thing. I is simply a story that we tell ourselves and others. I did this. I am that. I am going to do, 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 whatever. It's just a story. So because it's a story, because it's just a symbol, because it's just a word that doesn't have any corresponding existence, you know, like a country or a corporation. It's a simple, pure abstraction. There is no reality that corresponds to that. 
or a religion or a philosophy or whatever, pol political theory or whatever, you know? There is no actual reality attached to those words. They're pure abstractions, and so is the word I. There is no actual reality to it. So when we realize this, that's the end of the mind. The mind is based on the thought I. Ramana Maharshi taught that. So when the thought of I disappears, then mind disappears because there's nothing to call mind. <laughs> there is no I to possess those things. So that's the key to making the mind still is to erase the thought of I. What does I mean? It means there is an individual being who is separate from all other beings, who has his own identity, his own mind, his own thoughts, a separate body, all these different possessions, uh, assets, upadi. Uh, upadi means asset. And it also means a limiting adjunct. And the whole aim of yoga is to get rid of upadi. The whole aim of Buddha's teaching is to get rid of upadi. I'd like to get rid of this fly here. <laughs> so upadi limits the being. If this is my body, for example, then I am limited to this body. I can't go outside it. But then, you know, you have an experience where you leave the body and you go tripping around and you realize, wait a minute, this body is not a limit. It's not a cage. It's not a prison. I can go outside. The locus of my awareness can be located anywhere, not necessarily in this body. And of course, if that's true, <laughs> then why have a locus at all? Why does awareness have to have a location? It doesn't. Awareness can simply be all-pervading. Awareness, unconditioned awareness, is not limited by this body or, or that thing or the wall or, you know, any of those limitations. I remember one time I had a bicycle accident and the, the gear shift lever went right here, boom, right on my third eye, pow. And, of course, there was blood everywhere. <laughs> you know, there's a vein right here. So my mother took me to the hospital and uh, the... Uh, the internist was stitching me up, you know, the emergency room guy. And I went out of my body. I was like cruising around the hospital, <laughs> watching all this stuff, you know, like floating near the ceiling and looking down on everything. <laughs> I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old. So I knew from that point on I'm not this body. I'm not limited by this body. Huh? This body is not mine. See, the problem is, if this body is mine, then I'm be I belong to this body also. I'm limited by it. See? If some country is mine, then I belong to that country, too. See, it's reciprocal. It's mutual. We'll talk about the em emptiness of mutuality when we do the emptiness thing. So if, if I'm not, if this country is not mine, then I'm not this country's either. See? That's why when people say, what country are you from? I say, well, planet Earth, you know. But even that's a limitation. Why should I be from one planet? Why can't I be from everywhere? And I am from everywhere. That is the real nature of the self with a capital S. The self is everywhere and nowhere. Because location has no meaning for consciousness, for awareness. 
Actually, for consciousness, location does have a meaning because consciousness always has an object. But awareness doesn't need to have an object. Awareness can be <laughs> completely independent. And that's self-realization. So when the mind abides firmly and motionlessly in the state of self, with a capital S, that is mukti. That is liberation. Firmly and motionlessly. Firmly means nothing can shake it. Huh? Nothing can stir it. Huh? Not stirred, not shaken. <laughs> but firmly. Because anything that comes up is new. So it can't be real. Only that which is beginningless, unborn, and eternal is real. So anything that happens, anything that changes, by definition, it must be an illusion. Try to understand. If you can realize this, this makes your mind very firm and motionless. Well, there's no dimension to uh, to awareness, to self. There's no space. There's no time. So there can't be any dimension. That means there can't be any motion. See? As soon as you have mind, you have motion. Because as soon as you have mind, you have I. <laughs> then you have a location. Then you have motion. You see? It's a whole bundle. It comes all together. <laughs> it's a package deal. As long as you want to exist in some world, then you have a mind, you have an eye, you have an identity, a body. Even if it's a subtle body, it's still a body. A location, motion, activities, karma, and the rest. So to be free of all this is moksha is liberation. Actually, we're already free of this. This is the punchline. This is the joke. This is why this is why the Zen people, when they get realized, they laugh like anything. Huh? This is why I laugh. I'm laughing right now. <laughs> because we are already that. The individual consciousness is simply the awareness of the self reflected in innumerable bodies. Just like the moon reflected in innumerable puddles after a rain. Get that fly out of here. Try to understand. Is the moon in the puddle? No. The moon is up in the sky. But it appears in the reflection. So you may say it is there, but really it's not there. Only its qualities, only its attributes are there. See? So in the same way, the all-pervading, unlimited awareness of self is reflected in these many bodies. Huh? Even that silly fly. There's some awareness there. Huh? You think it's very impressive, you know, when you go in an airplane and you see the cockpit and there's all these meters and levers and dials and gauges and computer stuff and everything. Wow, great, right? Yeah, but a little bird, <laughs> here they have these little hummingbirds, like only this long. They can fly better than any airplane. huh? And their brain is about the size of a peanut, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of intelligence is there in that bird? Huh? We call we call somebody if they're dumb, we call them a bird brain. <laughs> but actually, birds are intelligent enough that they can fly, they can hover, huh? They can fly forward, backward. I mean, it's amazing what birds can do. So, <laughs> why is that? Because they have awareness 
that is a reflection of the universal self. And it's the same with us. We use only a fraction of our actual abilities because we think we're limited by the body. And it's only a thought. That's the thing that's so funny. It's just a thought. It's why are we unenlightened? Because we think we're unenlightened. Why are we limited by a body? Because we think we are. See? Why, why do we have to go through all this sadhana and all this austerity and study all this stuff and everything? Huh? Because to get rid of all these limiting thoughts, upadi, to get rid of all assets, the thought of owning something huh? or being related to something. This is my perception. This is my experience. This is my memory, my desire. These are the things that keep us in samsara. So as soon as we can drop the thing, the one thing that's common to them all, which is I, <laughs> as soon as we drop that, then we're liberated. See, this whole series, <laughs> I waited for a long time before doing this series because I wanted to lay adequate groundwork. The previous series, Ontology of Shakti and so on, are absolute prerequisites for this because without that understanding of the different levels, the different vadas, then this will be incomprehensible huh? or worse. You'll think you understand it, but you really don't becomes a misunderstood. So what we're talking about here is the junction, the sandhi, huh? the yoga, between the uh, vivartavada and the ajatavada, between uh, perceiving the world as an appearance and perceiving the world as never born at all between the highest level of sadhana and the level beyond, a level of realization where there's no need for sadhana. So I'm speaking the, in this series, I'm speaking from the level of ajata to the level of vivarta. Now, this cannot be faked. You cannot just jump up to this level. You have to have the background. You have to have gone through karma yoga and bhakti yoga and a certain amount of jnana yoga, uh, sorry, raja yoga, to reach this point, which is jnana. Huh? Jnana means knowing, but it's not intellectual knowing. It's intuitive knowing of the absolute truth, and that is the key to liberation. Aung Tatsat Aung Harihi Aung